everyone, welcome to this week's video. I know we're all pretty focused on the news right now and for good reason, but I wanted to talk about something different this week, something positive. Not to distract from the situations at hand, but to give everyone a break and maybe even another perspective. I received this book, Invisible Planets, as a gift for Christmas, and I've just finished reading the whole thing. I thought I'd do a review for you fellow sci-fi fans, so let's get into it. Invisible Planets is an anthology of contemporary Chinese science fiction, a book of 13 short stories by seven different authors, translated by award-winning author Ken Liu. In his introduction, he notes, Whenever the topic of Chinese science fiction comes up, Anglophone readers ask, How is Chinese science fiction different from science fiction written in English? Leo goes on to say that he often disappoints people with his response, branding the question ill-defined. And I completely agree, the question is poorly worded at best. Westerners don't stop to think how many different variations there actually are in the English language before wording their questions in this way. Besides, what they actually mean is, what kind of cool monsters and robots have you guys come up with? Anyway, while Lou might not be aware of it himself, though I'm pretty sure that he is, there are actually many acute differences between Chinese science fiction and Western science fiction that don't concern politics and instead shine a light on the distinctly Chinese characteristics of their writing styles, imagery and language play, their characters and associated mannerisms, their sense of humour, their fears, hopes, dreams and regrets. In previous years, it was incredibly difficult to access Chinese content, but globalization and the internet has greatly changed that. Consequently, what has also changed is the lens through which Westerners view Chinese content. While we once viewed everything through the lens of Western dreams and hopes and fairy tales about Chinese politics, this is now no longer the case. And I have to disagree with Leo's assertion that attempts to provide neat answers will only result in broad generalizations that are of little value or stereotypes that reaffirm existing prejudices. My generation grew up in a time where Western pop culture greatly appreciated things like anime, and Asian cinema. We were born too late and too far away for the geopolitical events of the past to have much impact on us. We were far more interested in Chinese culture and mythology. For me, reading this book was not only a window into the Chinese science fiction imaginarium, it was also a window into China itself, past, present and future. The stories are written with grace, intelligence, heart, humour and a little darkness, and by the end, you're left with the feeling of having participated in a gentle but haunting and at times really, really eerie waltz through time and space. You're taken on a diverse journey where danger is both mythologized and realized, and you regularly find yourself right on the cusp between hope and utter hopelessness. In the words of Ken Liu, and just quickly, I apologize if I'm pronouncing any of these names incorrectly. Feel free to correct me in the comments below. In the words of Ken Liu, you'll encounter the science fiction realism of Chen Qifan, the porridge science fiction of Xia Jia, the overt wry political metaphors of Ma Boyong, the surreal imagery and metaphor-driven logic of Tang Fei, the dense, rich language pictures painted by Cheng Jingbo, the fabulism and sociological speculation of Hao Jingfang, and the grand hard science fictional imagination of Liu Cixin. Liu also stressed the point that Chinese science fiction ultimately strove to say something about the globe, about all of humanity, not just China. Author Zia Jia, A Hundred Ghosts Parade Tonight, Tong Tong Summer, and Night Journey of the Dragon Horse, echoes this sentiment with the quote found in her essay at the back of the book. Our stories are written primarily for a Chinese audience. The problems we care about and ponder are the problems facing all of us sharing this plot of land. Looking at the bigger picture, of course they are correct. 
But I must argue that with a distinctly Chinese style and framework, the stories in this book inevitably take on a Chinese slant that is not always universally relatable. It is important to remember that the West has not and is not dealing with a lot of the same issues that China and other nations in the East have and are currently dealing with. Our experiences culturally and politically are not the same, and a great deal of the information moving between regions concerning these two interlocking landscapes is carefully edited and filtered so that no one, not even those living through these upheavals, can claim to know the whole picture. But this is what makes reading a book like this so interesting and exciting. I felt like I was getting a glimpse into a veiled world that I wasn't supposed to see. And now, all it's done is made me want to read more. Invisible Planets was a delight to read, and I recommend it to anyone looking to expand their library or experience something new. If you have any awesome sci-fi books that you think I should know about, let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you in the next video. The snow no more birds appeared in the sky, adding to the chaos that enveloped the world. The fluttering wings that were supposed to signal clear weather scraped across the orange sky like the return of snow-laden billows. Ash-white feathers filled the air, drifting down until they fell into the black orbs of my eyes, turning them into snow globes. On the 16th of February, I was born on the road to light, a refugee. My ebony eyes were luminous and vivid. But no one came to kiss my forehead. All around, people sighed heavily. I lifted my head and saw the ash white flock heading southward, their cries as dense as their light stealing wings. To the south was the door into summer, built from floating asteroids like a road to heaven. The giant star that lit the way for the refugees gradually dimmed, the shadow crawling up everyone's face. After the briefest experience of daylight, I saw the first twilight of my life. My mother's image bloomed in the dim glow like a secret flower. Mankind streamed across the river of time, aiming straight for the door into summer. In that moment, our tiny planet was falling like a single drop of dew into a boundless universe, tumbling toward that plane made up of the broken remains of the planet.